here. So if you, you know, you just want to be careful if you wander too far away. Um, we still want to pick up because for the, the live streaming. So if you have folks watching or stuff and so that that can be picked up. So just just keep in mind. I mean, don't, don't worry about it. It does. So it has a pretty good range. Where am I? <clears throat> Just for the uh, the audience, we are we are now live on Facebook. So just so that you're aware, um, we have gotten the, the live signal. What, Kelly, that's... We're, just so that you're aware, we're going to get started in about three minutes. We're going to give some more folks time to come in, and then we will we will get the uh, get the presentations going. Front row seats. All right, so we're going to get started, and but before we do that, I just I want to thank um, uh, Cara Hamilton, um, and I also want to thank Angie Hamilton. Um, Angie started this process. Uh, and then uh, Car is taking it over. So, um, but both of them deserve a lot of uh, appreciation for um, for ha making this happen this year and for getting us to this point. So, just wanted to thank you all. Uh, thank you both. Uh, and also.
also to thank the admission staff who have been uh, coordinating van shuttles and rides and sitting in Boston traffic. I'm sorry. <laughs> Boston traffic happens to the best of us, um, but also to thank um, the admission officers for, for everything they've done. Um, it's, uh, you know, to, to enable us to have such a wonderful event. So um, thank you all as well. Um, okay, we can clap. <laughs> um, so we're going to start. So this is the Beautiful Minds Challenge. Symposium, and we have students who have presented, who have submitted projects, who have received recognition and awards for their projects. Um, they will give presentations. Um, there will be room for questions um, and conversation. And you know, we hope that you engage, uh, you engage our participants with the same level of enthusiasm and engagement that they've provided to present these, uh, these incredibly thoughtful projects. Um, and as you'll see the prompt on the screen, what is a problem facing your generation? Share your solution. And the, the prompt comes, and I think Car uh, and Angie both addressed this a little earlier but with the group, but it's in recognition of that the group of students who are coming to coming to high school and leaving high school have really been presented with some uh, really in, in surprising challenges. And um, whether it's politics, whether it's violence in schools, violence outside of school, um, the economy, debt, all sorts of things. And this group has seemed to really challenge that in a way, um, with a voice that we haven't heard in some time. And so the prompt was really about getting at that conversation and providing room for that conversation to, to exist. And our competitors, I guess we can call them that, but it's more like our, our thoughtful leaders <laughs> have really offered us observations that cross that cut across technology, um, identity, individuality, self awareness, um, that discuss connectivity on some level um, within our community, um, person to person. How do we get off our devices? How do we understand what's going on with each other emotionally and on, on really profound levels where at times we're not necessarily doing that face-to-face, -face. doing that through a device or a screen or other ways. And I think one of the things that struck me that each of our participants is doing is cutting across that idea, the, that there's a perception of connect connectivity. Um, but, but how real is it? How profound is it? Uh, what's the meaningful side? And um, each of them offers really wonderful uh, and thoughtful insight, a question, an answer, a response um, to that level of connectivity. So really, thank you all for stepping forward. And, and as I told this group earlier, um, they didn't have to do this. No one forced them to do this. No one forced them to wrestle with this big, unanswerable question. Well, ultimately, there isn't an answer. Um, but each of them chose to do so. And, and in my mind, in my heart, I think that's what demarcates from our first Someone who chooses to do something because they believe in it, because they have a yearning to understand and dig in um, and, and, and achieve a level of understanding, uh, realizing that there's so much more to learn to figure out. Um, so again, I just want to I just really want to compliment you on your work and everything you've done. Um, and so can we just quickly just congratulate our, our recipients? And, and 
I will introduce the I will introduce them as they come up to do their presentation, so you'll get to know who they are exactly. Um, but I also just want to so we had we had two beautiful minds recipients earlier. Are there other beautiful minds folks out there from Marlboro? Awesome. So and, and do you mind? I wasn't here when you when you all were here, but could you just maybe tell us a little bit about your projects? Like, what did you what did you what did you talk about? Um, I don't even remember what the prompt. I don't know what the prompt was. So, innovative communications to notice people. Okay. Uh, my pro uh, my project was um, a very long essay on. Um, I come from Russia originally, and when I came, I didn't speak a word of English, and my parents didn't speak a word of Russian. And it was about how you bridge that gap by every which way possible. <laughs> yeah. I created an app that unites people through. Uh, it encourages people to um, communicate with each other with their phones, but by being off of their phones. So um, all of your contacts had a timer, and uh, in order to keep contacts on your phone, you had to meet up with that person within a certain time, and that basically makes contact with people, because we lose connection with each other through devices. So by encouraging connection through devices, we can understand. And then um, my project was a video that emphasized the importance of uh, uh, inter Awesome. Well, also congratulations to you all because that these are. I mean, again, in the in the time honored tradition of Marlboro, uh, you each stepped up, stepped up and, and and did something that was wonderful and contributive to the you know how we want to perceive and understand the, the future. So, thank you all. All right. So, Declan, you ready? <laughs> um, so we have. Declan Trevathan from Kyle, Texas, where he attends Jack C. Hayes High School. His project discusses volunteerism amongst youth, uh, which is something he knows a lot about uh, as the chief of his high, as the fire chief of his high school and an Eagle Scout. Declan, a recently awarded Eagle Scout, is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I will turn this over to Declan. <clears throat> All right, howdy. My name is Declan Trevison, and uh, pretty much my Beautiful Minds entry was an app that links people to community service through location-based services, and you can actually get signed off for volunteer hours and along those lines. So a little bit about me first. Uh, I'm 17. I attend Jack C. Hayes High School. I was born in Ohio, but I was raised in Kyle, Texas. Uh, I've been a Boy Scout my entire life, and recently this spring break I got awarded my Eagle Scout. Uh, I'm a varsity cross country runner, power lifter, and track lead for Jackson Hayes High School, as well as a fire chief for my high school. And so that's just a picture of me in fire gear, helping out with the Boy Scouts, everything like that, all on community service hours. Okay, so a little bit about the process first. So whenever I was introduced to the prompt, I immediately hung out with my friends and decided to talk about what community means to us first, as cheesy as that sounds. And so we learned through talking to each other about one of the most important things to us is volunteering. And we noticed a trend amongst recent friends in our high school that fewer and fewer people are actually volunteering. And so I decided to base my project off of that, the lack of volunteers throughout America. And um, the urgency within this project is the fact of the matter that in a connected world, we're more disconnected from local community centers and nonprofits more so than ever. And my app would make it easier to volunteer, participate, and link up with fellow volunteers simultaneously. Uh, again, the problem is that over 70% of Americans are no longer volunteering. That leaves a margin of 25 to 30% of people that are still doing that, and that margin is shrinking. That is leaving local community centers and many nonprofits in a huge deficit for volunteers, and quite frankly, many are dying out. And so that's just a graph to highlight the fact that Again, over three-fourths of the people are no longer volunteering. Okay, so how does it work? First, you sign up with the app through your legal identification, and from there, you'll have an account. And with that account, you can use your location, like you can use your device's location to show you all the nonprofits in your area. And from there, those nonprofits will sign up community service hours that they need to be worked. Now, you'll sign up for those hours. You'll actually participate. You'll go to the community service, and they'll sign off through their device that you actually came and completed those hours. 
From there, the hours are transferred to your account, and you can go to many different community service, like you can do it over and over again. That's the thing. It's not a one-time thing. And nobody's forcing you to do it either. You can go whenever you want, whenever you want. And so this is a screenshot of just my local area with all the nonprofits near me. I knew about three of these. It turns out there's over 14. And that kind of highlights the fact of the matter that we really don't know what's going on in our communities whenever we're so connected with it. And so again, there's over 12 different, 12 different services that I didn't even know existed before researching this app, and I think that they're underrepresented nowadays more than ever. Okay, what's going to make this app work is as fun as all things should be. One, it's going to link us together as a community. You're not going there by yourself. You're going there with fellow volunteers and people who volunteered with you as well. It's based on contact with people, not just you completing a second job or going to a second day at work or anything like that. It's supposed to be you're getting with your friends and you're getting with these communities and you're getting with these local nonprofits and completing meaningful work. And there will be a reward system implementing, implemented from local businesses as well. Okay, so more along the rewards, pretty much you could say a top 10 bulletin could be made with this. So the top 10 volunteers within your community, district, city, even state and nation could be ranked amongst people who have say, 30 community service hours, anything like that. So you can kind of place yourself amongst your friends and your community as well to see who's actually completing community service hours. And from that bulletin, also local businesses could say, say like, hey, if you completed 30 hours of community service, then you could be rewarded with gift cards and discounts. Like as my time working on my Eagle Scout project, I learned that Lowe's has a really big community, like a big communal agenda where they want local community projects completed. And so, Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. And so pretty much they could actually push for this app to work by rewarding you for the amount of hours that you work. And friends could set challenges within the app and within smaller groups within your own personal contacts that you can challenge you, even yourself. As seen in the next slide where this is the Garmin running app and me and my cross country team, we made this challenge to where the person who ran the most miles within the month, we had a $5 pot and Daniel, you can see one, but it's pretty much similar to the app that I'm thinking, where the person with the most community service hours could be ranked amongst just your local friend group if you don't want to be ranked on a national bulletin or anything like that. Okay, in conclusion, the app is going to work because it's fun, and it's bringing people together, and it's going to be easy and efficient, too. It's not just exclusive. It's inclusive to your community, and it has the possibility to actually save some of these nonprofits that are just dying away in the radio silence of the modern world. My name is Declan Trevithan. Thank you so much for you guys' time, and I'm thankful for the opportunity. So one thing, so so you had an experience though with your Eagle project. Do you mind telling us a little bit about that story? Oh yeah, so on my Eagle Scout project I actually had a hard time finding volunteers to even help me with my own personal work beyond my friends. And so I think like that's kind of what helped spark this idea too, because I was working on both simultaneously and it kind of helped illustrate the need for volunteers. So for instance, some of you might not know when you when you conduct an Eagle Scout project, there's a, it's actually a set period of required hours. Um, that you have to put in and, 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 and actually find people to do to do this work. So um, so congratulations on your Eagle Scout, congratulations on your work here. Do, do, do folks have questions for, for Declan? Oh, That's not a fair question. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's both because within our own scouting community, we'll volunteer every third Saturday to the local Kyle Food Bank and we'll see less and less people sign up on a monthly basis even. It's that gradual that we're seeing less and less volunteers as well as just looking at national percentages and watching the number of people who don't volunteer rise. Any other questions?
Next up, we have Lene Daria. Lene joins us from Keene, New York, not New Hampshire. Just want to be clear about that, um, where she's homeschooled. Um, we're excited that, to welcome Lene back to campus. She's attended multiple of our summer, uh, our summer programs. I think it's fair to say she's a huge fan of Marlboro. Um, and she's also, I think you'll find that her work has been inspired from her volunteer service at, uh, at a preschool. Uh, where I think your mom works. All right. So, um, so again, welcome. Hello, my name is Maria Dioria. I'm 16 years old and a homeschooling junior from the Adirondack Mountains in Keene, New York. I love to write songs, stories, poetry, sing, dance, paint, and study nature. I am so excited and honored to be here. For the Beautiful Minds Challenge, I decided to take a look at how technology, such as phones, computers, tablets, etc., are negatively affecting Generation Z, and what I could do to try to eliminate some of those effects. For my project, I hosted a retreat where I attempted to explain and show teens why a balance between experiences on your screen and experiences out in the natural world are important. I also attempted to provide a safe space where ideas could be bounced off one another regarding how to balance our lives. I did not pick this issue to shame using screen technology and say how bad they are because they're incredible in so many ways. We all know how helpful our devices can be. The issue is them balancing their usage in my generation. This problem has always been at the back of my mind, but I didn't really know what I could do about it. The Beautiful Minds Challenge was a wonderful outlet and opportunity for me to spread the message about how this imbalance in screen time is affecting us. I realized that if I brought people together to listen and relate to each other without the use of screens, that it could make real change. I hope to install a little bit of a new way of thinking around the time we spend on our devices. That's where I got the idea for the retreat. After I got the idea, I created the activities, speech, poster, and sp started spreading the word about my retreat. I ended up having seven people come. This is the schedule of my activities. It started Saturday, 9 a.m. From 9.30 to 10, we had opening circle. I gave an introduction speech on the issue and the science behind why we need to find a balance. Then we had a short group discussion. From 10 to 11, we had activity one. We got in tune with the world around us by going on a silent nature walk to listen and notice like never before. It's amazing how much we could become aware of when we didn't have the constant thought of a phone in our pockets. At the end, we did a short meditation to help us become more present and grounded for the rest of the retreat. From 11 to 12.30, we had activity two. We played childhood games that are frequently forgotten about as kids move into their teen years and are just as fun as staring at our screens. We played hide and go seek and a variety of board games. From 12.30 to 1.30, we had activity three. We disconnected from the instant answers and results you get from the web. We made our own meal using intuition, so in other words, without a recipe. From 1.30 to 2.15, we had lunch. And from 2.15 to 3.30, we had activity four and closing circle. We worked together to make a fort and then had tea and hot cocoa in there for our main discussion. Our discussion points included our intentions, how to keep a resolution, what we can do to continue on balanced and what will motivate us to do that, and what we can do as a generation to make sure that the scale of balance does not continue to tip toward the world of screens. Pickup was between 3.30 and 4 p.m. When I gave my speech at the beginning of the retreat, I spoke about why I had hosted the retreat and why the issue was so important. Also, I included some of the science behind why it's important to find a balance. Some of the main points included, there's research backing the idea that screens can have an effect like a drug pulling us in. There's research stating that it negatively affects vision, sleep, learning, self-confidence, and overall health in general. Screens affect social skills because people are using technology as a hideaway from having real conversations at times when they're feeling awkward or feeling nervous. 
The abundance of examples on the internet of who and what we should be and look like can greatly damage anyone, especially youth self-confidence. In addition, screens affect personality and emotions. Imaging studies have found that internet addiction and video game addiction can shrink the brain regions responsible for planning, executive functions, empathy, compassion, and impulse control. At the end of the retreat, all the attendees and myself sat together and had a discussion about how we could spread the message and become more balanced in our own lives. The key points of our discussion included making goals, setting timers to remind us to take breaks from our screens, spreading the information about the effects of screens, destigmatizing being uncool if you don't have a phone or iPad or other screen device, finding other activities to do on our own and with friends that we're just as excited about that don't include screens, and trying not to let our screens become an escape when we're feeling awkward or bored. Here are some pictures from the retreat. So here we're on our nature walk, um, and this is a poster that I sent out to people. Next one. <laughs> this is the phone drop basket. So at the beginning of the retreat, I asked that anyone that had any devices on them put, their, put them in this basket so that we could completely disconnect from social media and any, any forms of technology so we could really connect with each other. Here we're making music and here we're making the fort. <laughs> what I learned about uniting people through communication while making and putting this project into action was that more people than I thought struggled with a lot of the same issues as I have had surrounding screens. I had some worries that because technology is such a huge part of our culture that people wouldn't be that excited about my ideas. However, everyone seemed to relate to the issue. For example, when in social situations, they felt that because everyone else was on their phones, they should be too. They found themselves escaping to it when they didn't know what to say to the people around them or when they were just too nervous to start up a conversation. I feel this project was immensely helpful in processing my own relationship with my device and the time I spend on it. I had more of an addiction to it than I thought. It was so beneficial to discuss my experiences with people around my own age and hear theirs. I love that I had the opportunity to share the insights that I gained from my research and to help other people start on their journeys to becoming more balanced. This project was truly an incredible experience for me. Thank you so much for your time and attention. bring back some of the childhood things that we used to do. Well, yeah, tell us about that, because I you know, like, so you're, there's this idea of, I think I love the idea of the childhood games and as a means of stepping away. Where did that, where did that come from? Well, I think just when I was little, like, screens just weren't a big thing, like they are now, and, you know, so we used to, play games all the time, you know, outside, spend all of our time outside, and nowadays you see a lot of children just on their mom's phone or iPad, and I just, I don't, I don't love to see that, because I feel like so much good comes from those experiences that we have with our friends when we're little, and we're making up stories and playing outside in the woods. Kara, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, I was curious how you found your fellow retreat people, I was hoping to put posters up around town, but I just, not many people would see them because it's a very small town, so I ended up just sending, putting it on a couple social media platforms, even though that's kind of what I'm, uh, but, but it worked, because I got, yeah, so I, that's what I did. What did you cook? What did we cook? Because it seemed like um, there were some mistakes along the way. Yeah, it, there really wasn't, we didn't pick something really hard just because, you know, we were not chefs, but <laughs> we just did like an exquisite pesto pasta and a crisp, <laughs> a blueberry crisp. Yeah. Sounds very good. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, outside of the food question. <laughs> any other questions that we have to look at? Uh, Renee, did you I have I actually haven't seen a lot of the participants, but I would like to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I definitely I feel like I've taken a step back from my device a lot more. I'm trying not to have it take up my time because I think that a lot of the times I would just go on it and then get distracted by something and would an hour would go by. I just wasted an hour of my life, so I'm trying to really make sure I don't do that so much anymore. Um, but yeah, I think it helped me kind of process that I really did have an addiction to my device. I think there's a lot of head knocking around that one. <laughs> I look down for an hour and I don't know what happened. <laughs> well, congratulations again. <laughs> Next up, we have Micah Heilborn, Heilbron, and Eliza. I even managed to mess it up. I'm sorry. Um, Eliza Greenberg from Austin, Texas, where they attend Liberal Arts and Science Academy, or LASA as it's regionally known. Um, both uh, run the Jewish Student Union at their high school and have numerous leaderships within their community as well. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, we did our project on Jewish identity and exploring that a little bit more and the insecurities of that. Oh, also, I'm Eliza. Oh, She's I'm Micah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, a little bit about us. Uh, yeah, we go to Liberal Arts Science Academy in Austin. Um, we are really involved in Jewish youth groups throughout our community. Um, here in this one, BBYO, that stands for B'nai B'rith Youth Organization, and that's a really big international youth group. Jewish youth group is non denominational. It has like a lot of members, it's really big. And then NIFI, which is the National Federation for Temple Youth, that's more like uh, just in, in the US or North America, and it's like more like locally based and um, it's uh, reform duty, it's specifically reform nomination. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit about us. Yeah, that pictures us in Israel this summer. It's very, very fun. Yeah. Uh, so our project was exploring a Jewish identity uh, and in our reform community, so reform Judaism is kind of the more like laid back form of Judaism. The more uh, liberal and non traditional. The more liberal and non traditional. And a lot of times that brings up a lot of insecurities on like religiousness and like if you're like really, um, like what really defines someone as Jewish. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we sent out a drawing prompt and we interviewed um, the elementary school kids at our religious school, at our synagogue. We had some very interesting answers, very fun results. There was this one little girl who we asked, um, one of the questions was just like, what do you see like Judaism presented as is, like in the media? And she answered birds. And we asked her, we were like, what, what do you do mean you? by that? <laughs> yeah. She was like, oh, I just didn't understand the question. <laughs> she, she, was, she was in first grade. Very cute, very, yeah. very interesting response. Yeah, the, so the responses were really cute, and then we compiled them into an electronic book. So yeah. Um, a little bit about our process. We are American Reform Jews, so we're like, American Jews especially are just really assimilated. We've kind of, as a people, let go of a lot of like the historic traditions of like the specific rules. Um, mm -hmm. And like kind of our, what we've noticed is that there's really pressure from like both inside and outside of the Jewish community of like what exactly defines the Jew. Inside the Jewish community for Reformed Jews, you might like like feel pressure to become more Jewish because more traditional um, like denominations might kind of make you feel a little pressured that you're not like doing enough and then like outside of the Jewish community, especially with like the rise of anti Semitism in our country, you kind of have this opposite feeling where you where you feel like you shouldn't be as outwardly Jewish because it might like something bad might happen. So that's just kind of like what we wanted to focus on uh, and kind of where I, our ideas came from. Yeah. Just a little that's us at our confirmation last year, which is just kind of like a group bar by mitzvah we like lead a service. It's pretty similar to confirmation in Christianity. Mm -hmm. And that's us, I think, in Poland this summer um, with Kala, which is like a Jewish bread. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is just a little selections from our book. We'll just read a couple of them. You can read. 
and the quotes aren't necessarily from the kids that drew the picture we just kind of like put stuff together that like kind of had to do with each other we made it all anonymous and also like just kind of wanted it to be about what like about the actual content yeah um these are about like these quotes are about like the shooting in pittsburgh like that really hit the kids hard and like especially because a lot of especially young people haven't really faced any kind of anti-semitism that much until like recently so these kids are mm -hmm. kind of getting used to feeling this way and it's a really hard thing to grasp even mm -hmm. as a, even older people it's a hard thing to grasp so especially as kids they really struggled with like understanding what was what happened um, also i'm sorry that the pictures aren't super you can't see them super well um and then uh another a pretty simple quote i know that i will always feel jewish that was good we did see a lot of kids who did feel pretty confident in their Jewish identity, which we we actually weren't expecting. Um, yeah. We thought that they were probably more, um, I don't know, just questions behind like, what makes, Jewish, what makes you Jewish and stuff like that. And there was still a lot of that from that side, but there was still, but there was a lot of like confidence in their identity, which I was thought was really impressive for such like a young generation. Yeah, it was, it's even different. There's a big change from like when we were little in religious school, like, like I know we both are, Judaism is traditionally like passed down through the mother and neither of our mothers grew up Jewish. So that's something like just a little thing that like we have kind of grown up feeling insecure about and like, Questioning. Yeah, and a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah. Um, um, this one, I think this one's funny. It's God looking down on the Jewish people, just like, well, Jewish. <laughs> I just think it's true. And up there in the green one, you see the words, which is transliteration from Hebrew, obviously, and it means um, acts of loving kindness in English. And it was a really, saw, yeah, it was a really yeah. popular theme throughout. Uh, throughout our book, we saw Gimilut yeah. Chasadim pop up a lot, like just like that, those words. And like, I really, I was very proud of these kids who thought that being Jewish meant these acts of loving kindness and giving to the community instead of like rules and traditions. Like yeah. That. Um, again, like feeling alone in your Judaism. Yeah, and then the, uh, the one at the top there, it says a perfect Jew, well, that's tricky. People who respect others and just do what they want to and follow the rules too. So that's kind of like showing that there's kind of a duality here where you obviously still have to um, like practice some Jewish traditions to like be a Jew, but also a lot of it is just like taking the broader ideals of Judaism, like what they were said, like respecting others um, and applying that to your daily life. Um, these, again, this is just like a Shabbat dinner. And I think like the community is so important to these kids. And, but you also see some security, like sometimes if I don't go to Sunday school, if I'm at a service, I don't feel Jewish enough. And that's still like, if you don't do these certain things, like there's a lot of insecurity about it. Um, making the world a better place and helping God. We see that, we saw that come up a lot, like, um, the value of tikkun olam, like making the world a, um, a better place and better than you found it. And like being, that's something I really like. Is I think being Jewish is being part of the Jewish community. It doesn't mean believing in certain things. It means that you can relate to these people and you can be in a community. And I think that's what a lot of these kids have turned to in a time of rising anti-Semitism is really strengthened. the community. Yeah. So kind of just like our final thoughts. So kind of an overview. Um, also, if you don't know who that's, Jacob the Bar Mitzvah boy from SNL. <laughs> it's, it's, I love that skit. Um, and uh, so kind of an overview. We really wanted to, the way we addressed the problem was with discussion. And we think that that was the best way to like start it. And it was also a very big learning experience for us. And we really hope we, we think that was a good learning experience for the for the kids too because even though we live in a uh, even though we like um, are in a pretty laid back community there's still not a lot of discussion with the younger kids about like their their Jewish identity and I think it's really important to start that from a young age so that they don't feel the kind of insecurities that people in our gener even though we're pretty much the same generation but in our um, like age group kind of feel. Um, yeah. yeah, we just thought it was really interesting how much they value the community and how that's changing progressively. Yeah, and it was it was really a, just a really great experience to like see these ideas and be able to display the ideas of this like of the future generation and kind of how just amazing they all are. It was just a really great experience. Cool. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
So, thank you. Are there yeah. questions that are in the chat? Yeah. Do you have a copy of your book? It's do. online. It's online. We can somehow publish a link, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's just a little flip up online. It's kind of like a magazine. Yeah, it's like a e-book. Kind it's of. super cute. It's like adorable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hmm, I'm trying to think. Oh, there was one. We didn't put it in the slideshow. I don't think. Oh, we made it into our book, though. It was this drawing, and it was like, it kind of showed like the pillars of Judaism in this kid's mind. And one of the pillars, I thought this, not to get political, but it said torturing Trump, <laughs> which was so funny to see from a second grader. Like, <laughs> like every, every other one was just like, like it started with Shabbat. And like, yeah, it was so very just temple, like classic. And that one I was like, like that's just, that's so funny that that is what the religious school has taught him. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, on kind of like in the more serious side, I can't remember. I remember there was like, I can't remember specifically which one, but there's just a couple ones that were just talking really about how um, Judaism is important like to their family mm -hmm. and like how it just makes them closer to their family and like it's I don't know. It, it was just a lot of it was just talking about how like they don't really experience Judaism in their daily lives because yeah. they don't go to Jewish schools, and they, especially like in Texas, like there's not that many Jews like anywhere. And so um, they kind of talked about how they really felt a part of something. Yeah. And I also think the bird response was funny. <laughs> that was a good one too. The, the most powerful ones for me were really the kids who really like honestly and openly talked about um, anti-feminism and especially like this, because we did all these interviews like the week after the Pittsburgh shooting. And so it was really like these kids were so knowledgeable and so dedicated to coming to their community after this tragedy that happened and I think like these like like elementary school kids was just like really incredible to see yeah did this you know in what ways did this work did you reflect on your on being Jewish did like you know talking with these children did this spur you to reflect on your perspectives and and, and your identity yeah, yeah I think like definitely <laughs> I <laughs> I think definitely for both of us, we had that experience because, like, again, as I said, said before, like, a lot of these kids, we were surprised by their answers of, like, mm -hmm. how they were actually really confident in their identities, where I just didn't really see that same kind of thing in our, like, grade or, like, our, like, and couple older years. Yeah, too. the range. And in the, and in older generations. And so it's kind of made me rethink, like, why like why am I so like why why do I feel this way yeah. like if ki if young kids who are like very impressionable feel very confident in their duties before they've like gone through a lot of the same, gone through life then why am I not like that and so I definitely think that it's made me I think it has made me more confident yeah it definitely has made me more confident especially because we are both active in the religious school I teach a second grade class and uh, Liza works in the office and so I know like these kids look like look up to us and see us as these Jewish leaders and something that like we don't really see ourselves as and to just see that like these kids don't care that like we don't keep kosher or like <laughs> our mothers aren't Jewish like these kids just see us as people in the community and I think that was a very strong experience for a really profound experience. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Angel Andrews joins us from Henderson, North Carolina, uh, where she attends Henderson Collegiate. Uh, we're excited to welcome Angel to campus because she's joined us the last three summers uh, to hone her playwriting skills. Uh, and there's many of our members of our community already. Um, Angel aspires one day to open the performance arts nonprofit, performing arts nonprofit for youth in her community. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Angel, and I do come from North Carolina. That is a very, very long drive. Um, <laughs> um, today, um, I will talk to you about just the impact of social media on a young person's image, especially in today's society. 
Um, specifically, I chose to focus on young women, but also students or people in the ages range of 15 to 20. Um, it has been proven that social media actually causes a negative impact on students and people who are actually going through their everyday lives, involving themselves and interacting in technology. And I thought that it was something that impacted me, but also was like a great impact on people around me. Um, it was very common that you would hear people trying to lose weight or buy um, waist trainers and things like that to fit a certain image that they felt society was promoting and people weren't really accepting them because they did not fit that mold of what they should be. Um, I actually did a video. Um, my video is in the form of a talk show because it's what I regularly do. Um, I actually do a school talk show, so I address like school, school things that are going on. I address um, different issues that are going on in a society, and I actually did this as one of my episodes. Um, so you guys are the only people who've seen it. I've actually shared it and like brought awareness, and it's been talked about around school. And you see people. There's just been a change. Um, I actually posted this in February, so um, there's been a change in how. You see the girls around school, how they actually carry themselves. Nobody's really insecure about how they may not look like the person next to them or how this person is different, but this person may get more likes on the social media posts than them. And so it's just starting up a conversation and just creating impact and change because we don't want to continue to go through life, making everyone feel like they should fit a certain mold and a certain image versus just giving everyone the freedom to be themselves and have that self-confidence. Hello, Street Girls TV, and I'm your Shy. I don't have what society says 
um, would be acceptable to wear certain things, you know, with the body type that I have. The other actually did an experiment and showed that 30% of 13 year olds actually um, experience some type of appearance pressure um, from social media. Like I said about um, trying to fit and trying to mold themselves to particular events, 18 year olds, but actually 60% of them say that they have experienced appearance pressure from social media where they feel like they have to change. Accepted by society now. Taking those and recognizing, you know, how social media can cause those self esteem. We want to change those things and actually create a more positive environment. Um, building yourself, you know, it first starts with a positive thought. Give yourself a compliment. Look in the mirror and say, You are beautiful. Look in the mirror and say, You know, this outfit looks nice on me. Smile at yourself in the mirror. You know, it's all about how you change you because if you don't change you, no one else can change your mindset from feeling so negative about yourself to feel positive and be making no effort. So, focusing on yourself, changing your mindset from negative to positive, and just building your self esteem. Now, yes, yeah, social media will still be there now and then, but present yourself as positive on social media. So that you don't have to feel like you're being attacked negatively. And even if you don't get a lot of amount of likes that you want a certain picture, still continue to put your positive positivity out there, your smile, you know, and just remember that you are who you are. Because as you grow older, I'm pretty sure that you have to take yourself, your identity out to grow. And low self-esteem does not survive. So remember, in order for you to have high self esteem, make sure that you keep the positive energy. In conclusion, after I completed this experiment and completed the project, I learned more about myself in that I was allowing what was trending on social media to define what I felt was trending in my life. I found myself throwing away clothes that didn't seem popular or trying to spend more money on clothes that would cost me more, but I would fit the certain, fit what everyone else was wearing. Um, also, the lessons that I want everyone to learn is that remember that today is a new day and there's a new generation ruling. Don't let what society has continued to build up over centuries to define who you are and take that on to continue the repetitive process. Being that a new generation, being that we are a new generation, we should continue tr changing what's trending, not allowing what other people feel like should be trending, but creating that trend. And individuality should be the trend, whether it's not trending where one piece of clothing is what everyone should wear, but more so your unique type of clothing that specifically fits you should be what's trending. Also, in creating a change in yourself, as I talked about in the video, the change starts with you. So you can't go out into society expecting to promote change and you not take any action on the change yourself. You have to change yourself in order to inspire other people to take change because you can't preach what you don't, you can't preach what you don't act. So if you're not acting on what you're trying to tell other people to do, and trying to encourage other people to do it, and people are just gonna see you as a hypocrite. And that doesn't sit well with your conscience. So take the time to really sit down and recognize where you are as a person and recognizing if you're confident or not, and whether you are or whether you believe you are or you're not, just take the time to continue to make yourself more confident because every day there's a new, there's, each day is a new day and there's, more, there's never enough to grow. So you have to continue to create yourself into a, the better person that you can be so that each day you can create a new person that's better than the day you were before. <laughs> um, thank you. Angel, thank you. So are there questions that Angel can answer for you? How often does they receive the news? Um, the video actually, people were shocked when they first heard it because uh, 
this was kind of when I started a new series of like talking more about focusing on self versus outwardly. Um, so a lot of people were seeing it as a way of like really thinking about it. You know, I saw girls in the mirror, you know, saying like, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm different, but I'm still beautiful. And like seeing that change and like seeing that talk amongst people my age, you know, people just say, oh, the kids are moody, you know, they're being average teenagers. But to see myself, someone who never thought they could make a change, like create a conversation that caused people to reflect on themselves and create change in themselves is very like impactful. So how did you um, solicit questions Um, so actually I use social media. Um, <laughs> um I actually sent out sometimes I just send out questionnaires and like ask people what they want to talk about. And specifically for this one I said, you know, I just asked, you know, if there were questions that people had for me about um image and self confidence. Because a lot of people say I'm self confident, but even though as you could tell, like I share my experience. I wasn't always this confident about myself um, and how I looked. So it was very, it was just more me interacting, trying to see what other people's headspace was and trying to accommodate those and get people to understand what the importance of the whole entire um, situation was and the importance of just knowing yourself and not trying to fit what society wants you to. Angel, did you, I mean, you, you, this, so you have a show. Yeah. Basically, you have a show. And what have been, um, what have been some of the more challenging, like, I mean, I imagine this is a hard topic, but are there, are there other topics that you've taken on that you've been like, oh, that's a really tough one? Um, recently, I just lost a classmate to a car accident. And, um, and a year ago, I lost two other friends to a car accident. So I did um, a segment, a three-day series on um, just the safety of driving um, and the importance of just being safe when you drive because whether you feel like you're safe when you're driving or whether you're putting yourself in a situation where you're not, you never know who, what, who's going to be impacted by the decision that you make. And so um, I did a segment on drunk driving and driving, you know, under negative influences. Um, I also did one about following the rules on the road, you know, just being aware because typically, you know, I even find my parents, they, you know, speed sometimes without even recognizing it. So, you know, just like bringing awareness to those and um, just about the importance of community and love because, we recognized recently that, you know, the people who we lost, um, we didn't really express, you know, because we see them every day, you don't really sit down and say, I love you, you know, often. And so it was kind of like a wake up call to everyone just, you know, to spread love and positive vibes all the time and let people really understand how you feel and like have no regrets because you never know when it's your last day. And, you never know what what you say could impact, like how much impact it could have on someone, whether they go through life positively or negatively. So that was one of the most recent challenging um, things that I had to do. So next up, we have Leah Barnett, who joins us from San Antonio, Texas, um, where she attends Advanced Learning Academy. Leah is proud to be wildly different and is passionate about her art and determined to become a working artist. We're excited to welcome her back. She is also one of our summer program attendees. I <laughs> How are you today? Good, so I'm a little tired, it's okay, I am too. All right, so before we get into it and why I look like I look right now, let me tell you a little bit about me. So I'm an artist, I love art, I love to make things, I take pictures and I paint. 
I love to travel down there with the lovely lime green hair. That is me in Seattle, Washington in the lake called Parts Unknown. Um, and up there is me with my lovely Greek statue friends at the San Antonio Art Museum. And clearly I'm also a hair dye enthusiast. In between those two pictures I had about 15 different coats of hair. <laughs> so today I'm here to talk to you about bullying and specifically how that affects people ages 15 to 25 years old. So when I was presented with the question, what affects your generation? I thought to myself, what does affect my generation? And what affects me? Because sometimes, because I'm so into art and drawing, I don't really connect on a personal level with some people my age. But then I realized that there's something that connects us all in sort of a sad and negative way. And that's bullying. So I was reading the stats, and there are one in four high school students who are bullied, and one in five college students who are bullied. And this age range is, range is from about ages 15 to 25. And so I decided to focus on how those people are affected and how that affects them later in life as well. So bullying is defined as verbal, physical, or social. It's kind of an umbrella term for general mistreatment in a school setting or a recurrent situation. So mistreatment is more commonly defined as something bad happens once and it might be really intense and hard and scarring for you, but bullying is where it's happening multiple times in a day or a week. So the three main types, verbal, are things like teasing and name calling. We've seen it in movies a lot. We see it in Mean Girls. Oh, you can't sit with us. Physical is spitting, pushing, destroying property. Maybe you think of the karate kid when he comes home and he has the black eye and the big sunglasses on. And then a more difficult type of bullying to identify is social bullying. And we see that a lot on cyberbullying or spreading rumors and excluding people because you're not really talking to the person directly or physically hurting them directly. You're saying, I don't like you, but let me go around this roundabout way to hurt you. So what can bullying do to us? Bullying can feel like a weight. After a while, it starts to feel like you're being crushed. And later in life, it can crush you as well. Um, some of the effects of bullying are PTSD, depression, and in some of the worst cases, suicide. When I went to high school, I had just moved from Columbia, Missouri. I'd gone to San Antonio, Texas, and I was so ready. I had my mismatched socks on and my great, you know, black hair. I mean, I thought I was looking great. And the day before I went to school, I learned about David. David was three years my senior, and David had committed suicide the year before I attended my high school. David was a smart, loving guy, and he loved lacrosse, and he had a girlfriend who went to the same high school as me. But because he was involved with some people who thought that he didn't deserve the girl that he liked or some people who thought that he was a bad person, they cyberbullied him. And David attempted suicide and wasn't successful, and so he switched schools. But because of that connection that we constantly have to our phones or maybe to other people, and David was just trying to live, the bullying continued after he switched schools. And six months before I attended the high school that I attended in San Antonio, David committed suicide and was successful. So moving on from that, what did I decide to do? Because I couldn't just sit there and look at my peers and say, all right, well, we have a common problem here. I've been bullied. People call me freak. People say all kinds of things mean to me, and they say the same mean things to you. What am I going to do about it? And because I'm an artist, I thought, let's shock people. <laughs> so I decided that I was going to read the stories of people that I knew, or maybe my own experience, and people who had had some sort of problem with bullying in their lives. And these were people ages 15 to 25. So I wrote their stories on me, and I invited people to respond on one of the most popular tourist destinations in San Antonio, Texas, called the Riverwalk. There are over a million people where I'm from, and so there are thousands of people on that walk every single day. I brought my notebook and my sign that gave them the stats, and I said, write it down or tell me how you feel. These were some of the responses. Before people wrote anything down, some people cried. And they said, I've seen this. I've been through this. 
Some people didn't say anything at all. They just cried. Some people talked to me and they told me their experiences or maybe their family members' experiences or the things that they'd witnessed. And some people just stood with me. Some people offered me their coat because it was Texas cold. It was around 60 degrees. <laughs> and they said, let me just stand here and see what people do. But some of the most arresting responses that I had gotten were when people wrote. Some people gave me messages of support, and they said, be life, be kind, life is short, or be life, you could do that too. <laughs> Poignant message, I understand this. And some people told me how they're scarred. They said, they don't understand what they do to us when they do. I find it hard to trust. I have PTSD. I'm scared when people come up behind me now. One woman came up to me and she said, in high school, I suffered a miscarriage. And a group of five girls came up behind me and they called me a whore for the rest of the time that I was in high school. For me, that hurts to look at people around me and see how beautiful and amazing that they can be, but how horrible and awful the world can be. And maybe people don't even know that they're being mean or what they're doing is wrong. Maybe they're doing it out of something that's in themselves. But I knew that I had to start a conversation about it. So now we move on to the answers and what we can do together. You can share your story through art, like me. You don't have to do what I did. You don't have to go downtown and say, look at me, oh, <laughs> that's fine. You can encourage others to share their experiences and support each other through art. Now, art isn't just, oh, I took down and I, I took a paper and I drew, or I did a play, or I wrote on myself. Art can be conversation. And that's one of my favorite things about art, because whenever we're talking to each other, we're forming things on the spot, and we're saying, all right, I'm here and I'm creating. And so talk to your friends and your family and your coworkers about bullying. Now, that being said, I would like to have a conversation with you all. <laughs> what questions do you have? It's okay if you don't have any questions. All right, thank you very much. Oh, oh sorry. Um, were there any people who had a negative to yes, yes there were. <laughs> um, there were some people who were really confused by it and they saw me de walking down the street and they yelled, are those tattoos? I was like, no, but saying no. <laughs> there were other people, there was a riverboat driver, so on the river walk, it is literally two concrete sidewalks down a man-made river. And a riverboat driver walked up to me looked at me and shouted across the river, really? And then drove his little motorboat away. So <laughs> there was that type of thing, but there wasn't any blatant, oh, this is, you know, this is terrible. Why are you doing this? It was more just of a confused response than anything else. Please. From your personal experience, what do you think the reason is why people I think that the motivation is the same as what the target is. And what I mean by that is people are motivated by things that they don't understand. And maybe they're motivated, motivated by things that they don't understand about themselves. So I think that some people see things within themselves that they don't like and they see them in other people, and maybe they're expressing them more, and so they give the other people um, a negative time about that thing because they don't like it about themselves. And there are other people who just find joy out of being mean, which is really sad, but I think that people choose to bully because they have a problem with themselves, or they just don't understand how to express emotion in a way that builds people up. When we open the conversation, um, we talk about people getting bullied. 
and that reminded me a little bit of the way you sometimes talk about um, harassment and sexual assault and that sort of stuff, stuff where you talk about people kind of being the victims of it or the survivors of it. And so I was wondering if, aside from the poor guy and maybe um, the people who look at you here, if you had any game with the police, with um, maybe someone who walked up to you and said, Are you doing that in school? or yeah, um, I actually did have some of those, and some people wrote it down. More people um, talked to me, uh, and they didn't write anything down about it because they felt shame. Um, I did have a few people walk up to me and say, when I was in high school, I hated myself, which is a, it's a really sad thing to hear, but there was one woman in particular who said, when I was in high school, I hated myself, and I thought that if I made everyone else hate themselves and everyone else felt like they wanted to die, and they would feel like me, then it wouldn't be so bad anymore. So I did have experiences where people were walking up to me and saying, I used to do this thing, but now I know why, which kind of relates to your question, and now I don't do it anymore. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. So we are... We are at, uh, so our next presentation is Kimberly Pieper from Nashville, Tennessee, where she attends St. Cecilia's, um, and um, she's a dancer in theater, um, and uh, well, I, I've read, I read every application <laughs> to, to Marlboro, but um, but Timberland's also one of our early decision candidates, and um, and I actually happen to know her school very well, because I used to visit. Um, and what caught my attention was that uh, she had led a, a walkout um, in in response to the Parkland shootings, and uh, which is I would imagine wouldn't have been well received at her high school. Um, and so um, so she's already expressed activism in one form. But uh, she's here to talk about uh, something else. Hi, I'm Kimberly. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I currently go to St. Cecilia Academy. I have some pictures from when I was little, but also one in the middle of my brother, my mom, and I last Thanksgiving. When I read the prompt for the Beautiful Minds Challenge, the first problem that came to my mind was our culture of extremes. The ideologies people believe in are often prioritized over their connections to other people. When it comes to disagreements, people talk at each other instead of with each other. This is why the ad hominem attack doesn't work. Ad hominem is when you attack the person themselves instead of their argument. This cannot work because you can't change someone's mind by insulting them. As a kid, I often heard the phrase, treat others how you want to be treated. And I think this applies to our arguments as well. How can you expect anyone to respect you if you don't respect them? Earlier, I said I go to St. Cecilia Academy. This is a very conservative, all-girls Catholic school run by the Dominican Sisters. As an agnostic in a Catholic school, I spend a lot of my time in places where people don't agree with me. There have been many moments in the last four years that I've been frustrated with the opinions of those around me. And it's taken me a long time to figure out how to engage in a setting where I disagree with the information given to me by my teachers. Every year, St. Cecilia students are required to take a religion class, but senior year is a little bit different. Instead of a traditional classroom setting, senior religion is entirely Socratic seminar-based. Every day we focus on different discussions on a really wide variety of information. Both this year and briefly freshman year, the talk, topic of LGBTQIA rights has made its way into the religion classroom. Current class, Catholic doctrine is, isn't as accepting of LGBT issues in the way that I hope it will be in the future. The sisters still hold the view that being gay is wrong. But understanding that their perspective comes from their own background and how they've been raised helped me to not feel angry with them, even when I don't agree with them. It took me a long time to get to this place, and for a while I was really angry with the sisters. But I realized that being angry with them didn't get me anywhere. I had to be receptive to the fact that the sisters who teach me have a really different background than I do. 
Because of my years at St. Cecilia, I've learned that if you don't jump to anger, you leave a place open for discussion. You have the ch chance to change someone's mind instead of just yelling at them. This leads me to the second part that inspired my submission. If we pretend that every person has the same background as we do and the same experiences, we lose a key part of our culture, individuality. I've often heard people take pride in the fact that America is a melting pot of nationalities, but I've never really liked this metaphor. A melting pot is a combination of many different substances all mixed into one middle ground. If you mix up the chocolate and the caramel in that image, you don't have either of those two things anymore. You have this middle. I think that people need to strive to be a salad bowl. A salad bowl is a combination of many different ingredients that each contain their original state. No matter how, much, how mixed up that salad will be, it will never be entirely one substance. Similarly, some people describe themselves as being colorblind when it comes to race. But being colorblind isn't accepting people's differences, it's ignoring them. Imagine if every person in the whole world had exactly the same experiences as you do, and thought exactly as you do. Sure, you wouldn't have as many arguments, but the world would be really boring, and we'd never get anything done. It's our different understandings of the world which bring new solutions and options that we never thought of before. So here's my piece. Um, I asked three friends who have very different backgrounds to let me photograph them. Then after cutting their portraits into strips and adding a portrait of my own face, I wove our pieces back together. I wanted to explore what would happen when I put them all into one face. Then I wanted to see what would happen when I changed which faces were the warp and which were the weave. Putting them together this way, you can still see the individual boxes of each face, but they would make one portrait as a whole. This was important because I didn't want to erase the differences between the faces. Their lives and their backgrounds are valuable, and pretending that these differences don't matter doesn't let us know each other better. It just gets rid of the ability to learn from one another. If you assume people have the same background as you do, you'll assume that they have the same opinions, and when they don't, it gets easier to judge them harshly. By weaving the faces together, and then by showing how different the final faces were, depending on where the original faces were woven, I wanted to show both how much we have in common despite our differences, and how much more interesting our connections can be if we give different voices equal space. For this slide, I included the four original portraits. They're not in my piece itself, but I wanted you to see what I started with and what I made it into. Making this change can seem really intimidating. That's why you have to start in your own life. If someone makes a remark that seems like it's offensive or rude, ask them to clarify. Sometimes we misunderstand each other and that leads to arguments when really we didn't know what the other person was trying to say. Recently, I found myself in a conversation with a peer and mentor who I respect very much. I realized as he reacted to something that I said that I had offended him in a way in which I hadn't intended. I had to decide whether to address the way in which I had been misunderstood and risk angering him more or just apologize as though I had meant what he thought I meant. I was happy to have another mentor there who noticed the dynamic had changed and asked us to address it. She started that simply, just saying that she thought we were misunderstood, misunderstanding each other and that we both seemed to really care about each other and the topic. From that introduction, I could overcome the fear that I might offend, might offend my friend further and take the time to clarify what I had meant by my earlier comment. My friend was able to hear me differently and stay open to changing his mind about my perspective. It was hard to push through that conversation because I had to be willing to, to risk insulting him more as I tried to be better understood. But the courage it took to stay in that conversation was worth it. We ended up in a place in which we both understood each other better. This is only my personal experience, but I believe that there are other people of all kinds of backgrounds who share my frustration with how much anger surrounds us now. I'd like to find a way to link small groups of those people together for publicly visible, thoughtful conversation uh, that they would commit to have with kindness and patience. I've been really inspired by the Ask a Muslim and Ask a Real Indian videos online. These people make themselves available on street corners and social media. They create a safe space for people to ask questions and to understand each other better. I believe there's a way to mirror this in everyday life. Maybe we initiate small gatherings of very different people who, through conversation, look for the things they have in common. It's important that these are not necessarily people who know each other or are good friends, 
but instead individuals whose curiosity is stronger than their fear and could commit to this kindness and patience during the conversation. If we were able to regularly have those conversations in public spaces, they might initiate the curiosity and interest of other people nearby and invite them to share in the talk. I learned a lot by working on this project. I didn't realize how similar the faces would be when I finished weaving them. So from an artistic perspective, this project helped me to discover the common features of seemingly diverse faces and to experiment with the placement of those comp components. But from a more political perspective, I learned how difficult it is to imagine large scale projects that can achieve the same outcomes as smaller, more easily influenced ones can be. I also know I'm a perfectionist when it comes to my artwork, but I had to let that go for this piece. I learned that it didn't actually matter what the final portraits looked like. It doesn't matter if all their eyes line up or if the faces are symmetrical. This piece is about clearly seeing each separate face while still acknowledging their similarities. I also realized that the solution to this problem would be slow. Lasting change takes a long time, but change is possible. You can't give up on trying just because it might take a while. Thank you. Questions for Timberly. So I imagine um, you, know, you approach this work from a variety of perspectives. You know, it's kind of like there's a sociological, there's an art component, you know, civil rights. I mean, there's a lot going on, and I'm really interested. When you started working tactically, like with the with actual strips, um, you know, what were you thinking when you were weaving these faces together with these individuals? Were you, you know, was there a plan? Or was it just you just started doing it and you're seeing what was emerging? So, you know, so I'm curious about that artistic process to some yeah. extent. Like, how did that manifest for you? I had done a woven portrait before, but it was um, two almost identical images that then I wove together. So it was the same face. Um, but I wanted to see what would happen if I had four entirely different looking people. Um, and my original plan was just one woven image, but as I was working, I realized that because of all the extra strips that I had, I could make four. Um, so it would have been like one smaller image. It's only about this big, each individual piece. Um, but together, like the four really showed like the way, it, like, each four is a different section of that person's face. So like each image I did, the left half of one person's face, the right half of another, the bottom half of one person's face, and the top half of another. Um, and then each of the four pieces is a different variety of one of those. Um, so I just kind of messed around with like who, whose faces match up at different points and like what pieces look the best and like taking out pieces because then I can move like an entire feature up. And it was just interesting to see like how physically where the strips were affected the portraits as a whole. There are other questions for Timber. dynamic to be in because there is still like a difference in authority because it's my teacher um, so I think I think the sisters have less hesitance in telling me that I'm wrong than I do in telling them that they're wrong um, so like I, I think there is an aspect in which like because every year senior religion is based like this like the sisters do know like how to let the students lead the discussion a bit 
so to some extent they are in, involved in saying like, well, this is what the Catholic, Catholic Church teaches and bringing it back to like, it is a religion class. Um, but I, th I think they are willing at least to let the students engage in like what their actual opinion on something is. Um, even if like at the end of the day, they're gonna tell me, well, in the Catholic Church, this is what we believe. But they, I've never felt like the school made me feel obligated to be Catholic or to believe in the same things. They were just telling me what it was that they believed. So. Thank you. So we, have, we have our final presentation, and uh, this came with a lot of coaching, but uh, <laughs> Cham An Bam uh, from, uh, has traveled the furthest to be here, and also uh, goes, by, goes by Angie. I apologize, I forgot that. Um, has traveled the furthest to be with us today. She joins us from Tan Hoa, Vietnam, um, but attends TH Academy in Hanoi. Uh, Cham An is passionate about film and visual arts, and we're excited that she was able, well, actually, I think the visa process was quite a bit, so we're excited that you're here, Maggie. <laughs> Thank you so much for working your magic, uh, <laughs> but uh, but we're we're really appreciative that uh, been able to travel this far to be with us for her presentation. And as I said, this is going to be our our last one. So finishing off. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I will give a short introduce about my myself. Well, I'm Chen Mang and I'm just turned 18. Well, I love movie a lot, and uh, my top three movies are The Breakfast Club, Shawshank Redemption, and About Town. So, because I love movie that much, so I I believe that movie is the best way to tell a story, and I decided to tell the problem that I think that I'm facing and young people around here, is, uh, I mean, out there also facing. And yeah, I made my first movie completely by myself and I'm really proud of that. <laughs> and um, okay, basically my movie uh, identified about the fact that we actually forget the way to practice love to love, I mean, love here is self-love, love your friends, your family, your life, community, and the whole world. Offline, both offline and online. We don't really know to, I mean, we don't really know the, the right way to express our feelings and to capture others' feelings. So my movie basically is about that. And I also include my conclusion in this movie. So first we will watch that movie and then I will explain more about the process of why I came up with that idea. Okay. Hay đi trải lá về hè, quan trọng là có cái không gian để người ta tâm sự. Thế nhưng trên thực tế, có bao nhiêu câu chuyện thực sự ý nghĩa là diễn ra ở quán cà phê? Chúng ta có thực sự có chuyện với nhau khi đi cà phê không? Ta là một cái gì tự nhiên hơn không? Đúng vậy đấy, chúng ta đã được có ít nhất một lần để được nói chuyện chỉ vào bên ngoài. Cũng người một cái điện thoại, ta là chết, ta là lướt ta tận dụng gì đó vào cái điện thoại của mình. Chúng ta chẳng hiểu vì sao thì lại không có hay tài nào để nói với nhau. Thế thì lên Facebook tí như thế nào? Xem con cái gì hay hay trên đấy có các bạn cùng làm với nhau. Càng nữa là thôi. Tất nhiên có ai được đến. Tất nhiên những thói quen nó sẽ trả lời họ. Nhưng nếu bạn cùng nhìn hành động của mình thì có lẽ thay vì hai người đi cà phê nói chuyện 
kita tidak untuk mungkin disebarkan di kafe pun. Tentunya kita akan berzoom di kini akhir. Kita sudah cek enam. Tak terlalu mungkin bagi orang lain di kafe di kafe dekat masjid. Kita bersyukur banyak untuk sejak ini lah yang kau cakap dengan aku dan dengan aku. Tak dengan dia kini enam. Tak terlalu saya lebih mencuri. Câu trả lời của mình đã từng là chưa Mình không ý thức được rằng Thế ra là mình phải để tâm lý đến mắt Thì chỉ thay đoạn điện của người đó giết mình Thay vì đó là một story của họ Để xem họ có đang thể suy nghĩ gì bất thường Sau đó cảm thấy đó không Đó không nên là cách chúng ta là nghe nhau Không cần quên với việc nắm bắt cảm xúc của người khác Chúng ta dường như cũng quên luôn Cái cách để thể hiện cảm xúc của chính mình Khi có tâm sự trong lòng Thay vì mình lấy đó để chia sẻ Chúng ta đã đi tìm Facebook để trả lời câu hỏi Bạn đã nghĩ gì? Điều gì đang ở trong người bạn vậy? Hãy hát lại cái story vô cổ lên Instagram Và dù vô tức hay cố ý Thì bạn cũng không chờ ai đó sẽ direct Instagram hay một viên hỏi hai người Nói chuyện gì thế? Thế hệ chúng mình thì thật Cứ ngồi yên, thở dài Và chờ đợi người khác chủ động quan tâm mình trước thôi cũng vì thế chúng ta trở nên cô đơn hơn đôi khi còn trách móc người khác vì sao chẳng ai quan tâm đến mình và thương mình lại trong cái thế giới nhỏ trên điện thoại cũng hẳn là phúc nhưng mà cũng khắc hổng nặng Tạm vừa chắc khỏi lần tiếng đi học buổi sáng giáo viên thì có bắt sáng có vẻ không xuất sẻ ngồi về nhà ngủ với sức có đi làm Chúng chẳng nhìn The bus stop in the middle. Does that make the movie really artistic? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. We have to wait for like a lot of bus. That just that's true to get that bus start. So yeah, I'm really happy. Well, back to the process that I came up with this idea. Uh, when I was, I mean, I'm taking a gap year, and for the first three months, I have my first job as a like uh, a movie reviewer. So I go to a sneak show and then write the review for the website of my company. And I mean, my, the company that I worked for. And um, at that time, like my world is really small. There are only eight people in my, uh, my team is my friends. And they actually, I don't think that I got along well with them. 
so I feel I felt really lonely and uh, I mean every weekend is hot was horrible because I I didn't know what to do and I yeah I did exactly what I do I did I did in the movie like I pulse vaguely that I'm okay, I'm not okay and I really expect someone will anyone in the world that used to be or was or am or are my friends will direct me and ask something like hey how are you yeah what's wrong or something but the result was, was no one and uh, at, at that time I, I saw that only me in this world felt and had that only me had that situation yeah and I'm I am like flood, flooded in the insecure and self-doubt and unhappiness so then I left that job and then I went back to my hometown and I I worked for a coffee shop near my house and <laughs> during only two weeks that I worked for that coffee shop well yeah and then now people don't really go for go to the coffee shop for work or something they just only go for work mostly to hang out and then chatting yeah so and I was really surprised when seeing people just like they go with their friends but they sit there for like three or even five hours but not talking only sit opposite together and then glue to their smartphone and then after the drink is done then they get back well and that scene just repeat every day that I worked in the coffee shop and then I I thought a lot when I came home so I decided huh that is this is really a problem not only to me like glue to the screen and then yeah people don't really talk and really share and really showing that how they care about each other even we really love each other but we assume that everyone know it <laughs> yeah because it's not your last day in the world and so you will not do a meaningful like you stop doing meaningful thing and do caring for a town so yeah I decided to do that movie and actually I filmed it and edited it only in three days after four months like wide month uh, I mean oh four only four days I stay up late to learn how to do premiere and then <laughs> weeks after practicing and then I think I'm ready and yeah I travel to Hanoi going to the best I mean the best stall in Hanoi to film scene and oh this is also the I mean I think this is the most beautiful coffee shop in Hanoi one of the most to film this only in three days with the help of my friend I mean he lent me I mean I borrowed he uh, his uh, equipment and yeah within it in three days really excited but I, I'm proud myself and my friend and, and yeah so the, the last thing I learned that I learned from the store set and of my whole project is that I I think that I my I mean my role in, in this world is to be a storyteller to tell other people's stories by filming and to make other feel I mean to feel more about to to learn to practice to capture to observe and to understand more about themselves and to express feelings to the world because I think it's necessary and uh, the first the last thing is I uh, I mean I think that when you are not when you are not happy then you try to do something nice as I I wrote I actually wrote a letter to uh, and then I in my last day working at this coffee shop I wrote a letter and then I just put it in a random table and I hide I hid in a corner and waiting for someone <laughs> to come to that table and then yeah a girl came and then when I watch her reaction and then her smiled and I'm really happy and at that time I think yeah try to do something nice and practice love 
and spread love more as necessary. The world needs more love. Yeah. Thank you for listening. <laughs> it's okay. Oh. Yeah, I have a question. So, um, I wonder what steps you personally take now to avoid the addiction to your phone and social media. Uh, I, I cannot really. Yes. Yeah, so how do you uh, prevent yourself from just scrolling mm -hmm. constantly oh, on yeah. Facebook? Well, I actually, I mean, I deal it all the social media apps on my phone and I I don't know I like install an extension in my browser and on in my laptop so it will like it's only allow me to scroll and surfing Facebook for like 30 minutes a day oh yeah and then <laughs> and then I just I think when we really think about our behavior to the technology and phone, and then we pay more attention when we intend to pick our phone and check in notification, and then we will we figure out our own way uh, to like prevent <laughs> prevent us to yeah do more. I mean yeah to be addicted to the phone. Yeah. And read more book. Well, <laughs> during that time when I was self doubt and that all perfectionism. Why doing this movie? I I read four books that I remember and love the most is a book from Elizabeth Gilbert named uh, I think uh, The Big Magic. Yeah, and uh, yeah, just read books and I think that you and yeah, like Lenae has that. <laughs> Go out to the nature and just listen to and notice that thing that you never notice because you're always good to your phone while walking now so watching people my way is to observe um, I'm curious why you think people are finding it easier to connect with others through oh. instead of the person why does it seem easier to have a conversation through the phone and through social media than to just talk to the person? Next well, year? I well, I don't really think it's easier. Easier, okay, it's easier to be contact through the phone, but I think the most effective way is still talk in person, that you can see their eyes and their feelings. And from that you, I mean, you have to be noticed. You have to notice because when you do with your phone to chat, you can chat like a lot of people at the same time. But when you talk to someone, you can only change what they've done in their story, what they are saying. So I think that is the true way to communicate. Yeah. <laughs> it's well Yes. So I know that we
Teach you to do that pretty envelopes, <laughs> and then yeah, let's figure out. And yeah, they are free to put the letter anywhere in the city or in the hometown. And um, I think that the problem here is I have to convince them don't hide somewhere and try to watch other I mean people exchange their reaction when they what I and mean, read read that uh, I mean the letter, but. Um, yeah, I have to think, and I think I will have some discussion. And do you think any? I mean, I really don't know how to convince them that the happiness came that come from. I mean, the behavior. I mean, the action that you wrote something nice to people, and you don't really, you know, you don't have to care that you. I mean, their reaction back just. Feel nice when you do something and you're spreading love to whoever. Yeah, they will get the letter. So I will figure out how to say and I mean convince in an evitative way. <laughs> but yeah, for now I'm just thinking of that. But actually, I also think that I will do like a series of them to reflect more problem about yeah that same kind of problems. Yeah, to reflect it. Well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Could the other presenters just stand up? And again, you know, thank you for your. Excellent and good work, and I think in along uh, Kristen's message, carry it forward. Um, so congratulations again. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here and for participating and being engaged in in these conversations. And um, with that, we conclude. Thank you.